Welcome to Stuff You Missed in History Class, a production of iHeartRadio's How Stuff Works. Hello and welcome to the podcast. I'm Holly Fry. And I'm Tracy V. Wilson. Uh, and <laughs> uh, as is often the case, sometimes when you work on one show, you spiral off and start seeing other things that are vaguely related to the topic of that show that you really want to do an episode on. Mm-hmm. It happens to us all the time. And sometimes I can put those off for a while, and I'm like, I don't feel um, like a burning need, like, I got to do this now. But I don't know why this one, not the same deal. I wanted to do it right away. So while I was working on our recent live show that we did about spirit photography, I, of course, stumbled across a whole bunch of other interesting photographers from history that I wanted to talk about. But this one in particular really stood out. And initially, it was because of a very striking and really fun subject self-portrait that she made in the late 1800s. But here is what really struck me about today's topic, Fanny Johnston and her work. She is tied to so many people and events that we have talked about on this show before that she's kind of like a history nexus point. She was really well-connected, and she was able to make a very nice living for herself as a photographer. She had a very long career that spanned the late 19th and early 20th centuries. So, Fanny was born Frances Benjamin Johnston on January 15, 1864. Her parents were Frances Antoinette Benjamin and Anderson Donovan Johnston. She was born in Grafton, West Virginia. The Johnstons moved to Rochester, New York when Fanny was still very young so they could be nearer to her maternal grandmother. By the mid-1870s, the Johnstons had moved to Washington, D.C. Anderson was working at the Treasury Department as a bookkeeper, and Fanny's mother, Frances, was a journalist. She wrote for the Baltimore Sun and other D.C. area newspapers. The Johnstons really supported Fanny. They encouraged her to study art when she showed an interest in it. She was in a position of really rare privilege for a young woman of her era, Her family could afford to support her while she studied, and they were 100% willing to just let her figure out her own path and her own desires. Yeah, it does not appear at any point in time that they were like, are you going to get married? Are you going to find a husband? Are you going to be a mom? They really were like, great, go study art wherever you want. In 1883, Fanny graduated from Notre Dame of Maryland Collegiate Institute for Young Ladies. And after her undergraduate work, she traveled to Paris to attend the Académie Julien, where she studied art, particularly drawing and painting. She spent several years in Paris and then returned home to Washington, D.C. in 1885. She joined the Art Students League, which was an organization that offered ongoing development as well as studio space and a sense of community. Fanny also started working in journalism, first as an illustrator for news stories. But sometime in the late 1880s, uh, you'll sometimes see it listed as 1888, Fanny discovered the field that would become her life's passion, and that was photography. She started studying photography at the Smithsonian Institution under the mentorship of Thomas Smilly, who was a Scottish-American photographer who served as the Smithsonian's first staff photographer and first photography curator. And that first camera she owned came from George Eastman of Eastman Kodak, The story of how that happened is a little bit fuzzy. Fanny would tell people later in her life that she wrote to Eastman asking some questions about the camera, and then he sent her one as a gift. More likely than not, she had connections to the Eastmans through her mother's side of the family. Yeah, she kind of liked to tell it almost as though she was a random anonymous person just sending him a letter and asking some questions and that he generously sent this back. But it does seem, especially because the Eastman family was also from Rochester, that they were somehow connected to her mother's side. Fanny's formal art training was something that informed her work with a camera and gave her something of a head start in that field compared to other photographers. She also was very aware of this and a a little bit proud of it. She had a sense of composition and light value that really enabled her to frame incredibly beautiful photos through her lens. Her Parisian training also gave her a degree of cachet and esteem that, along with her connections through Smilly and her family, put her on really good footing to start her career. She started that career right away. Not long after starting her study with Smilly, Fanny also started working as a professional freelance photographer. By 1889, she was publishing her own articles with full photographic illustration for publications like Cosmopolitan, Harper's Weekly, and a lot of other periodicals. 
The first of these was a piece called Uncle Sam's Money that ran in Demarest's Family Magazine, and it showed the process of producing currency, including both coins and bills. In 1891, Fanny Johnston had her first show, mounting an exhibit at the Washington, D.C. venue, the Cosmos Club, which was, quote, a private social club for women and men distinguished in science, literature, the arts, a learned profession, or public service, which was founded in 1878 and still exists today. She soon started having showings of her work in New York City as well. In 1892 and 1893, Fanny was one of the official photographers of the World's Columbian Exhibition in Chicago. While Fanny continued her freelance journalism photography, in the mid-1890s, she also opened her own photography studio. The studio she set up specifically to take portraits, and it was behind her parents' house on V Street in Washington, D.C. It was really portrait commissions that made up the bulk of her income for years. Her family was well-connected, and that meant that the High Society of Washington, D.C., which included some very powerful people, would go to her for their portraits. These connections, in turn, fed her journalism career. She got great assignments from editors who knew that she could get access to people that the average photographer might not be able to. Yeah, this is kind of a good example of, like, how a position of privilege can really help someone oh, even yeah. when we're not conscious of it. It really was a case where, like, her family's positioning and how many people they knew and how many people liked them were feeding both sides of her career, like, one to the other. In the late 1890s, Fanny worked for George Grantham Bain, who was a photographer who had started the Bain News Service, which was a photo syndicate that served periodicals throughout the country. Uh, I have seen the numbers as more than 14 of, like, the major newspapers in the country were using photos from his service. Fanny also gained access to the White House around this time as a regular photographer. That was a job she initially got on assignment through Demarests. And she took photos in the White House beginning in the Benjamin Harrison presidency, and she continued assignments there right up through the Theodore Roosevelt administration. Coming up, we'll talk about some of Fanny's most famous photographs, which are self-portraits. But first, we will pause for a quick sponsor break. As we mentioned before the break, uh, some of Johnston's most famous photographs were taken during the 1890s, and these were self-portraits, showing her in a variety of different guises, and they served as an interesting commentary on the way women were seen and how they perceived themselves as the Victorian era came to a close. This is also one of these portraits that caught my eye initially when I stumbled across her. In one self-portrait, she looks every bit the society lady. She's posing in a fur and a wide-brimmed hat that is trimmed with ribbon and several ostrich plumes, and her elbow rests on the arm of the chair that she's sitting in, and her gloved hand sort of reaches up to her face, with her index finger resting on her jaw and the rest of her fingers tucked under her chin. In another photo, which is quite famous, she's very unladylike for the time period. She sits in front of a fire on what looks like a box. Her right ankle is crossed over her left knee, so that reveals her petticoat and stockings. She's wearing a plaid blouse with leg of mutton sleeves and a dark cap on her head. Her right elbow is balanced on her right knee, and she's leaned forward at an angle to do this. She has a cigarette in her right hand, And then in her left hand, which is at her hip, she has a beer stein. She appears to be deeply interested in something to the left of the frame from the viewer's angle. And there are six photographic portraits on the mantle behind her, all featuring male subjects. She titled this photo, New Woman. It's the striking self-portrait that Holly referenced back at the top of the show. Yeah, I really love that picture. Me too. It's one of those things that uh, it's staged, obviously, because it's a self-portrait, but it she's so good at it that it does look like you've kind of caught someone in the middle of a a, a moment where they're completely unconscious mm-hmm. of how they look. Mm-hmm. She looks like she is super engaged with something, like she's leaned way forward. It looks like she may be about to say something or tell someone off. It's just a really great photo and very much not appropriate for a lady of the day. Uh, She also made several portraits in which she is gender-bending, fully dressed in menswear and sporting a false mustache. 
And in some of the portraits where she's dressed as a man, another woman appears who is also dressed in the same style, full menswear with a mustache, and a third woman in more traditional ladies' wear for the period also appears in those pictures. So these and other self-portraits, including one in which she's going about her work in the studio, offer a unique spectrum of identities for one woman. And it's possible that her chameleon-like nature was helping her make her way in a profession that was really dominated by men. I mean, she succeeded in this field in spite of it being so dominated by men. She clearly understood the social rules regarding the expectations of dress and behavior for women. She was also comfortable stepping way outside those boundaries. Yeah, again, that's one of those things that I think most children that had not been born to the privilege of having parents going, yes, explore yourself, would never have gotten to that level of confidence where they would be able to do those things, uh, particularly in this era. But unsurprisingly, Johnston was outspoken about the need for women to redefine their options and their identities outside of the predefined roles of mother, wife, and homemaker. In 1897, she wrote an article for the Ladies Home Journal, which was titled, What a Woman Can Do with a Camera. And this article urged women to consider photography as a profession and a means to support themselves. The article opens with, quote, "...in order to solve successfully the problem of making a business profitable." The woman who either must or will earn her own living needs to discover a field of work for which there is a good demand, in which there is not too great competition, and which her individual tastes render in some way congenial. She goes on to mention that for some women, the, quote, restricted fields of typewriting, stenography, clerking, bookkeeping, etc. would prove wearing and uncongenial to them. Fanny also listed the qualities that she believed were necessary for success in photography, and those included good common sense, unlimited patience to carry her through endless failures, equally unlimited tact, good taste, a quick eye, a talent for detail, and a genius for hard work. She felt that a woman who was hardworking and energetic could find success and that, quote, small beginnings could reap large results. So this article is not a bunch of cheerful fluff about how all you need is determination. Fanny really broke down exactly how the industry worked and what fields were good for beginners. Portraits, she felt, were best saved for when you got a little more experience, but taking pictures of homes, animals, and children outdoors and staging photographic copies of paintings were all good places for beginners to make some money. And she really made the point that while someone wanting to go into the field could get training for taking photos, running a business was a whole other skill set. She was very clear about this, and she thought it was best learned through experience. She also felt that professional photographers had to stay on top of the latest advancements of the art. She then included practical information about cameras and lenses and tips for taking photos to help a newcomer get started. She concludes by insisting that women have to charge an appropriate amount for their work, Quote, good work should command good prices, and the wise woman will place a paying value upon her best efforts. She explains that this is really where tact is necessary and remains steadfast throughout that photography is the perfect career for an ambitious woman. I feel like the good work should command good prices should be like... Still today. F- ...framed and hung everywhere I walk. Yep. <laughs> yep. Uh, she was not one of those all work for exposure women. Nope. She was very savvy. It was like, I made this art for you. You will pay me now. Uh, That article appeared in Ladies Home Journal in September of 1897, and it was much talked about. Even a year later, the same article was quoted almost entirely in another article, this one appearing in the periodical The Photo Beacon, which is, of course, aimed towards photographers. And uh, this iteration of it makes clear that Fanny's advice is good for not just women, but all photographers. In the October 1898 volume in which it appears, it states, quote, her counsel on the management and arrangement of a portrait studio, on the treatment of sitters, and on the business side of photography is so sound and so applicable not only to those who are about to enter professional life, but also to those who are already in business that we reprint it in full. As an interesting side note as we consider Johnston's writing, which is full of ideas of empowerment for women, Johnston identified as bohemian and not as any kind of activist from the suffrage movement or anything else that was related specifically to the rights of women. Obviously, we don't mean bohemian in the sense of someone from bohemia or in the more pejorative connotation that it took on for a while in connection with the Romani. 
Fanny was using it in that romanticized sense that tied it to unconventional artists. And that usage came into popularity in the mid-19th century with the staging of the play La Vie de la Bohème in Paris, which was an adaptation of the Henri Merguet novel Scène de la Vie de la Bohème. And coming up, we're going to talk about an event that has been featured many times on the show. Uh, it comes up over and over <laughs> because it, too, was a nexus point in history. We're going to get to that right after we first have a sponsor break. The 1900 Exposition Universelle in Paris has come up a number of times on the show. I feel like everybody who was anybody in 1900 was in Paris for that (laughs) that show. And here it is again. Uh, Fanny Johnston attended and entered a number of photographs into competition there. She won a gold medal for a series of photos she took of public schools in the Washington, D.C. area. And she also took home a grand prize for her series of photos of the Hampton Normal and Agricultural Institute. So these photos over time have become the focus of heated discussion because they show Black and Native American students really through a white Victorian lens. Uh, We've talked about some folks that studied at that school on the podcast before. In the context of their era, these images, which were commissioned by the school, were intended to show European audiences that the United States was progressive in its educational systems, which were integrating Black and Native American students into white society, but that meant stripping them of their own culture in the process. This is a deeply flawed ideology. It's Like I said, something that's come up on the show before, that mindset in addition to the Hampton Normal School specifically. And if you want to really dig into these pictures and how they've been perceived over the years, there's a really interesting analysis of these photos and how they've been viewed at three different times when they've been on display. Uh, That that article came out in the summer of 2008 in an issue of History of Photography. We will have a link to it in the show notes. But the abbreviated version is that at the 1900 Paris exhibition, they were, just as we mentioned, a sort of self-congratulatory promotional material. Uh, The second exhibition, mounted at the Museum of Modern Art in 1966, tried to decontextualize them from any discussion of race and just treat the photos simply as art, which is very problematic in its own way. Uh, And in 2000, a Williams College Museum of Art exhibition mounted by contemporary artist Carrie Mae Weems focused on the controversial nature of the photos and their history and the nature of racism in education and how it is perceived both from the white perspective and from the Black and Native American perspective. While the 1900 Paris exhibition was going on, Paris was the host city for a concurrently running event, which was the International Congress of Photography. For that gathering, Fanny ensured that the matter of women in the field was up for discussion. She put together an exhibition of art photos by women and also lectured on the topic of women in photography. Yeah, I had read uh, one description of it that she had put together this exhibition. She was one of only two women that actually were there, but she had arranged really at like great personal effort to have the work of women, both novices and professionals, exhibited at this show, and that those crates full of photographs arrived before her And the people there that were prepping it could not wait for her because they were really curious what this collection of women's photos looked like. So they had already opened all of the crates when she got there uh, just because they wanted to see them. There was such a great sort of curiosity about how this whole thing was going to work and what this idea of women in photography was. In September 1901, uh, President William McKinley was photographed by Fanny at the Pan American Exposition. Uh, We have talked about this on another recent episode. This was the last photo that was ever taken of McKinley because he was shot the next day and then died some days later. In 1905, Fanny's story links up with another past podcast subject, which is the Lumiere Brothers. As Johnston made her way around Europe that year, she stopped in France to visit with them, and she got up to speed on the color photo process they had developed. She also took some charming photos of their father, Antoine Lumiere, including one in which he's painting another man's portrait. I don't know why I really love these pictures. They're just very sweet. He's just like a sweet French elderly man. In one, he's like out in a vineyard looking around. (laughs) In another, he's just painting. He seems very relaxed. I just love those pictures for some reason. Uh, In 1909, Fanny was hired for a job that ended up shifting her career away from portraiture and into new subject matter. 
At that point, she was hired by John M. Carrere to take architectural photos of the new theater in New York. And at this point, Johnston was also growing a little tired of portraiture. She felt like it had become too stressful, and the field was very competitive, and so she didn't really feel like she had the freedom to get any sort of artistic fulfillment from it any longer. And so architecture was kind of a nice change of pace. After the new theater, Fanny also started exploring other photography opportunities outside of working with people as her subjects. She turned her eye and lens to gardens. From 1910 on, her work is very garden-focused. She gave lectures about them. She researched historic gardens. She took innumerable photos of them well into the 1930s. As part of her ongoing interest in gardening and architecture, she had a studio in New York from 1913 to 1917, and that specialized in garden and home photography. Yeah, those lectures she gave, she made these incredible glass plate slides for them that she hand-tinted. They're really incredibly beautiful. Um, One of the articles in our our show notes is a Smithsonian article where they talk about them. So if you're interested in that, check it out. Um, But that photography studio that Tracy just mentioned was shared with another photographer and kind of her partner in it, Maddie Edwards Hewitt. And the two women had met at the Pan American Exposition in Buffalo, New York in 1901. Fanny, of course, was already pretty well known by that point. She was essentially a famous photographer. And the two women became both colleagues and close friends. At that point, Hewitt's husband was a photographer and she was helping him. But she wanted to transition to doing more photography work herself. And Hewitt was eventually entrusted by Johnston with the development of her photos. And there's been a lot of speculation over the nature of Fanny and Maddie's relationship over the years. The two women exchanged letters almost from the moment that they met. And Maddie's in particular. Maddie also wrote more of them. Uh, often include language about just how deeply she loves Fanny and how she dares not hope that Fanny loves her back, including passages like, quote, I am not foolish enough to expect you to love me in this way, only it was so sweet and meant so very much that I could not but tell it over and over. There are detractors who uh, believe that Hewitt's words were not unusual in tone for women of the early 1900s. This is something we've discussed a whole lot of time on the show, that the correspondence of women is often much more sort of romantic in nature, not necessarily always indicating that there is a romantic relationship, but just an emotional closeness. Uh, But in this case, it really, really does sound like Maddie was definitely romantically in love with Fanny. Uh, I will say we have more than her letters, and we'll talk about why in a minute, but we're, we're not as clear on Fanny's feelings in return. Yeah. So in 1909, when Maddie Edward Stewart divorced her husband, she moved to New York with Fanny. The same year, Fanny started focusing her, her lens on architectural subjects. From 1913 to 1917, both women became well-known for their work in architectural photography. This partnership was severed in 1917. The two women had a falling out. Hewitt bought out Johnson's interest in the business for $500. Both of them continued to have successful careers independently after this point, thanks to all the connections that they had made while running their joint studio. Yeah, um, Fanny kept Maddie's letters. But it doesn't appear that as many of Fanny's letters to Maddie were preserved. So that's why it's we don't have a, uh, an abundance of quotes from her on her feelings on the matter, and we're kind of having to fill in some blanks there. Fanny's work had often had a documentary quality at this point because she was working in gardens and architecture. But starting in the 1920s, that became an even more prominent part of her work when she started a project that would go on for more than 17 years. Johnston started systematically photographing and documenting early American buildings and gardens. And this all started when Fanny was contracted to photograph the Chatham Estate in Virginia, as well as Fredericksburg and Old Falmouth. And that effort took two years. And when it was done, Fanny decided that she wanted to continue to use her camera to document historic buildings and help preserve the architectural history of the U.S. She started exhibiting her architectural photos and in 1930 started the Pictorial Archive of early American architecture at the Library of Congress. In 1933, the Carnegie Corporation started issuing a series of grants, six of them over the course of a few years, to keep that project going and expand its scope. From 1927 to 1944, she took thousands of photos of more than 1,700 sites across nine states. They were Virginia, Maryland, North and South Carolina, Florida, Alabama, Georgia, Louisiana, and Mississippi. 
And she didn't only capture grand mansions and impeccable historic gardens, although those were in there for sure. She also made a concerted effort to get images of buildings and spaces that did not get the benefit of constant maintenance and care, as she sort of saw their fragility in the face of neglect. And the sizable collection that she amassed eventually came to be known as the Carnegie Survey of the Architecture of the South. And that remains in the collection of the Library of Congress. During this time, Fanny's work was also published in several books as photographic illustrations to the text. In 1930, she contributed to colonial churches in Virginia with text by Henry Brock. In 1938, Plantations of the Carolina Low Country, written by Samuel G. Stoney, came out with Fanny's photos in it. In 1941, her work got top billing for Early Architecture of North Carolina, a pictorial survey by Francis Benjamin Johnston. This included an architectural history written by Thomas Waterman. Yeah, though that book, she is listed as the author of that book. Um, Once that photographic survey of the South she had been working on was completed, Fanny moved away from Washington, D.C. to the South. She made a new home for herself and her two cats named Herman and Vermin, which I find quite charming, in New Orleans, Louisiana, starting in 1945. By 1946, she had found her permanent home in the city at 1132 Bourbon Street that is just a block away from the LaLaurie Mansion in the French Quarter. I think there are people who would argue about whether Washington, D.C. is also the South, but New Orleans is definitely much farther South. I call it the deeper South, for sure. (laughs) The seed for this move was planted when Johnson was doing her field work for the survey. In 1937, while taking photographs in Louisiana, she told a reporter that New Orleans surpassed other cities, quote, in rare beauty of ironwork, of outdoor and indoor arts and crafts, in a romance of aspect and spirit, of character and charm that are unique in America. She uh, fell in love with New Orleans, and I can't blame her because I sure do adore that city. (laughs) Very understandable. Uh, It is really pretty. And during this same period that she had moved and she was kind of into retirement, Johnston was inducted into the American Institute of Architects as an honorary member for the work that she had done for so many years in preserving the record of architectural history with her photographs. In her advancing age, Fanny, who had a career that spanned six decades, spoke of her work in almost a cavalier manner, as though it was just all effortless guesswork and good luck on her part, which is very funny to me. But she had been known to be utterly meticulous in setting up shots and in creative staging techniques to capture images in her own unique way. She also kept meticulous notes while she was in the field as a journalist, including her personal thoughts and feelings right alongside the more technical notes that were related to her photos. On May 16, 1952, Fanny Benjamin Johnston died. Her body was transported to Washington, D.C. for burial in Rock Creek Park Cemetery. In 1953, her remaining papers and documents were sold to the Library of Congress. Over the course of her career, she had photographed five U.S. presidents, as well as Booker T. Washington, Andrew Carnegie, Mark Twain, and dozens of other prominent people. She was also the wedding photographer for former podcast subject Alice Roosevelt in 1906. Yeah, and I will say those are very beautiful portraits. Uh, She really was extraordinarily good at her job. Uh, She also photographed Susan B. Anthony late in her life, which uh, it's a very interesting profile photograph. And again, it, it strikes me as slightly interesting that she was not particularly interested, it seemed, in the, the suffrage movement in terms of being an active participant, but she took a very beautiful picture, one of the people deeply associated with it. Uh, that is Fanny Johnston, who I find fascinating in a variety of ways. Uh, her photographs I could look at forever because they really are quite interesting. Um, I have two pieces of listener mail, and they are unrelated, except they both came from Hawaii. Okay. (laughs) Which, like, New Orleans is another place that I'm deeply in love with. Um, The first one, I cannot make out the name. It starts, I think, with a J. It could be June or Julie. Just a little bit of smearing. And it writes, Aloha, Holly and Tracy. I just thought you might enjoy this Disney Hawaii postcard made from koa wood. Love the show and glad it's appropriate for my two young history buffs. Uh, Would love more Hawaiian content with Aloha. And it's a a cute little, uh, as as it said, wooden postcard from Aulani, which is the Disney resort on uh, Oahu. It's so sweet. I love it. The second one 
is uh, from our listeners, Kristen and Todd, and they sent a parcel, and it excited me. <laughs> You're right. Aloha, Holly and Tracy. My husband and I listened to the episode on the history of vodka some time ago and have been meaning to send this to you. Like Holly, vodka is my spirit of choice, so I really enjoyed this episode. We live on Maui and have two distilleries on the island. Both are delicious. In my opinion, we have sent you some to try along with a few other goodies. Fun fact, the word pow, which is uh, the name of one of the vodkas, means finished or done in Hawaiian. So when you finish recording, you can pow hana, which means like, that's like the time when you relax after you're done working. So uh, Kristen and Todd sent us two kinds of vodka, one from pow and another called ocean, which is an organic vodka that I have tried before uh, when I was in Hawaii. And I am deeply thankful, and everyone in the office was wildly jealous as I opened that particular parcel. <laughs> <laughs> so, Tracy, next time you're in the office, we'll have to uh, make a little cocktail at the end of the day. And enjoy the bounties of Kristen and Todd's um, generosity. And also just, again, I love I love hearing from our listeners, especially when it's a place that I have not been in a little bit and I'm kind of longing to get back to. So yeah. hopefully soon. That's lovely. Oh, man, Hawaii is the best. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. It is so sweet. I um, We say it all the time. I'm sorry if you're tired of hearing it. Every time we get gifts from people, I'm just kind of blown away, and it's very humbling and moving because I don't make the time to send things to people I know and love <laughs> and, and that I'm, like, related to. So it uh, it's really very meaningful and it's something I'm very deeply thankful for. Uh, so thank you, thank you, thank you again. If you would like to write to us, you can do so at History Podcast at HowStuffWorks.com. We're also everywhere on social media as Missed in History, and our website is MissedInHistory.com. You can subscribe to the show. We would love for you to do that. You can do that on the iHeartRadio app, at Apple Podcasts, or wherever it is you listen. Stuff You Missed in History Class is a production of iHeartRadio's How Stuff Works. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows. 